please welcome Francisco with applause on this call. Thank you very much. Okay, should I start? Yeah. Yes, okay. thank you. Thanks. So uh, it's extremely nice to be here with you. Uh, as I said, I'm Francesco Tiziot. I'm a developer advocate for a company named Ivan, which is a nice company coming from Finland. And we are doing kind of open source data platforms as managed services on top of the cloud of your choice. And the choice of clouds includes all the major clouds. The choice of open source data platforms include a lot of open source data platform, including Kafka. And you will be able to check more on our website. Uh, I'm not Finnish, I'm Italian, and you will notice a little bit of this later on. So let's talk about event-driven applications and Apache Kafka and Python. If you are a PyCon Japan, I could assume that you know Python already. On the other side, you may start guessing or asking yourself, what is Kafka? Why should they care about Apache Kafka? And in order to understand that, we have to go back in history a little bit. We have to understand how things were done until a few years back. Until a few years back, you had either a new shiny app that you just invented, or you inherited an old app and you had to support, expand, or maybe take it to the new world. No matter if old or new, I've never seen a Python application working in complete isolation. You will have components within the application that needs to talk with each other, or you will expose the application to the world, so you will have this application talking with other application. So Apache Kafka, let me give you, share with you a secret, is a tool that makes all this communication easy, reliable, and in real time. If we go back a few years and we analyze how applications were created until a few years back, we had applications that were more or less always storing data in a backend database. But they were not pushing one record at a time. They were creating a batch of record and pushing that to the database. Or when reading from the database, they were reading a bunch of records at the same time. This was more or less adding a consistent delay when from when the information was available in the application and when it was stored in the database, or the opposite, when the information was available in the database and when it was stored, it was retrieved from the application. On the other side, we live in kind of a fast world and we cannot wait this kind of waiting time. We need to create event-driven applications. What are those? Those are applications that as soon as an event happens in the real world, our application needs to know about it, start parsing it, and probably take the outcome and pushing it to another application that will be another event-driven application, creating a chain of those. But you know, we understood why we need to create event-driven application, but we still need to understand what is an event. And you know, events happens every second in our life. We are really used to events. We are used, for example, to receive notification. And you know, <clears throat> when you use your credit card, you receive a notification in your phone. When someone else stole your credit, steals your credit card and makes a payment, you want to receive a notification and you want to act as an event-driven application and immediately block your card. You cannot wait two hours or five hours. You want to act immediately. In this time of pandemic, specifically in Europe, or I believe in the rest of the world as well, we have been getting used to create events, for example, taking out our phone, selecting a food application, selecting a restaurant and making an order. And you know, I'm Italian, so I will take you my experience. In Italy, we do that a lot with pizzas. So we'll select the pizzeria and we'll select the pizza. At a certain point, we create the order and this is an event. The restaurant will receive the order and will act as an event-driven application, start creating the pizza. At a certain point, the pizza will be ready and we will receive another notification. As you can see, this kind of event-driven application is not something new, something that has been existing for a long, long time. So another bit to it, why should we create event-driven application? Well, let me give you an example. In this fast world, the value of an information 
is strictly related to the time that it takes to be delivered. If you think about you know, the position of the delivery person taking the pizza to your house, you want to know the position like 5, 10, 20 seconds ago. If by the time that the position is taken from the delivery person to the time that it, that it arrives to your mobile, you have five minutes of delay, that information becomes useless. So we need to have a way to be able to communicate in real time and to transmit the information across all our components in real time. And basically, this is what Kafka is. But what is Kafka in the backend? If we do one step back and we try to understand what is Kafka, Kafka is a really simple concept. It's the concept of a log file well, where we write events one after the other in an append-only and immutable format. Append-only because we write events one after the other and immutable because once we write the event in the log, it's not like a record in a database. We cannot go there and change it. If something changes the reality of event number zero, we will store it as a new event in the log. And of course, Kafka cannot only handle one log of one type of events, can handle multiple logs of multiple type of events that are called topics in Kafka terms. Even more, if we want to put Kafka at the center of our data village, we need to be sure that Kafka doesn't lose a message and Kafka doesn't crash. And with Kafka, this becomes by default because Kafka is a distributed system. This means that when we create a Kafka instance, almost every time we will create a set of nodes, a set of servers, which in Kafka terms are called brokers. And now our log information will be stored across the cluster, not only once, it will be stored multiple times following a parameter which is called replication factor. In our case, we have three copies of the sharp edges log, so replication factor of three, and two copies of the round edges log, so replication factor of two. Why do we do that? Well, because we could potentially lose a node because we know that computers are not reliable and still we are not going to lose any information. So we said that Kafka is a way to store events, but we also need to understand what is an event for Kafka. And you know, for all that matters to Kafka, an event is just a key value pair. And you can use really simple events like I want to store the temperature max as key and 35.3, the value as value. Or you could go pretty wild and you could store both in JSON format, the uh, shop name receiving the pizza order together with the phone line used to make the order. And in the value, the order ID, the name of the person making the order together with the list of pizzas. You can use JSON in format or you can use other formats like Avro, for example. For Kafka, it's just a series of bytes. Kafka doesn't really care what you put in it. So now that we understood what an event is for Kafka, it's time to understand how to write to Kafka. And you know, we will have an application, in this case, Python, that is a producer and produces data to Kafka. Produces data to where? To a topic. In order to produce data to a topic, all the application needs to know is where to find Kafka, host name and port of the brokers, how to authenticate, and how to encode the information from, for example, JSON to the raw series of bytes that Kafka understands. On the other side, if we want to read from Kafka, we will have an application which is called a consumer. And what the consumer does is it reads event number zero and then communicates back to Kafka, event number zero is done. So Kafka stores the offset knowing that consumer read already event number zero and then moves to one. The application reads event number one and communicates back to Kafka, the same for two and three. Why is this important? Well, again, because we know computers are not entirely reliable. So we could lose the consumer, the consumer could go down. Still, the next time we reinstantiate the consumer, we don't want to reread the same topic from the beginning. We want to start reading from the point in time, from the point in the log that we, we, was, we were reading before. And since Kafka on server side keeps the offset, it will be able to send to us the item number three in this case. In order to read from Kafka, 
all the consumer needs to know is where to find Kafka, host name and port, how to authenticate, and how to decode the information that previously we encoded. The last bit is which is the topic of the topic names that we want to read from. Now, for this, it was a lot of slides. I want to show you a real pizza-based demo. So let's move to a nice demo. There we are. So what you see here, it will be a set of Python notebooks. The Python notebooks will guide us through all we have to know about Kafka. In order to use Kafka, I need to have an uh, Apache Kafka instance running. And what I did with the first notebook that, by the way, you will find a link at the end of the presentation to these notebooks to create a Kafka instance on Ivan. So I created Kafka PyCon Japan Day instance. You can do the same. If you go to Ivan, you can create a service. And as I said, we offer Kafka, but we offer also a lot of other open source data platforms. So let's start. Let's try to produce messages. So let's install the Kafka Python, which is the default library in Python to work with Kafka. It's installed. Now we create a producer. We need to say where to find Kafka, host name and port, how to authenticate. I'm using SSL in order to authenticate and how to serialize the data from JSON to the raw series of bytes that Kafka understands. So let me create the producer. Now it's time to send our first message. And bear with me, I'm sending a nice pizza order from myself. And just because I'm talking with you, I'm going against any of the Italian rules and I'm ordering a pizza sushi. I don't think you will find this in Italy, but you never know, new culture, new mix. We will see in the future. Okay, uh, the code executed. So the message should be sent to Kafka. How can I be sure about that? Well, you know, we can go and attach a consumer. Let's do that. And with Jupyter Notebooks is amazing because I can have the producer on one side, let me close this, and the consumer on the other side. So being able to show both sides of the application at the same time. So let me create the consumer. And you know I need to point where uh, Kafka is using the same SSL authentication. And before I was serializing, now I'm deserializing. OK, now I connected to Kafka. Let me check which topics are available. There are some internal topics together with a nice Francesco pizza topic, which is the one that I created on the producer side. Let me subscribe to it. And now let me start reading messages. OK, we can note a couple of things here. The first one is that this thread never ends. And we are expecting this because we want to be ready in event streaming mode as soon as an event arrives to the topic to read it. So we expect this thread to never end. On the other side, we submitted the pizza sushi uh, order from the producer side, but we didn't receive it on the consumer side. This is because by default, a consumer, when it attaches to Kafka, starts reading from the point in time that it attaches to Kafka. So since we, start, we produced the event before we started the consumer, we are not able to fetch it. This is the default behavior, and you will be able to change that. But just a warning here, this is what you get if you don't change any parameters. In order to show you, however, that the full pipeline is working, let me produce another couple of events. Adele ordering a pizza Y and Mark ordering a pizza with chocolate. Now, again, in Italy, the pizza Y is completely forbidden. With chocolate, you can have it. Um, this is the Italian rules. I don't know what's uh, happening in Japan. And I'm happy if you want to share with me what ha what's happening there. What is your favorite pizza, for example? So let me run those two. And immediately on the consumer side, we see them appearing. So the pipeline, producer, Kafka, consumer, it's working. Good? I believe so. So let's now move back to a little bit more slides. We said that we can push data to Kafka and Kafka will keep the data. However, we may be interested in to keep the data in Kafka forever or, or only for a limited amount of time. And we can do that. We can tell Kafka for how long to keep the data in two ways. Either we can say, keep the data in Kafka for six months, two hours, forever, 
all kind of by size. We can tell Kafka, keep the data in the topic until the topic reaches 10 gigabytes, and then delete the old chunk and let the topic grow again. You can also use both. Since we are talking about retention, we need to talk about the size of the log, the size of a topic. And you know, if you remember what I told you before, I told you that a topic was stored on a broker, on a single node of a cluster. It would be sad if we would have to limit the data that we keep in a topic because of our disk space on the smaller server on our cluster. Or on the other side, if we had to purchase huge servers because we have to store huge amount of data. We don't want to have this trade-off. So what we can use, it's a Kafka concept called partition. Partitions is a logical way of taking data coming from the same topic, the same type of events, and splitting it into subtopics called partition. So if you remember my pizza examples, I could have, I could partition my pizza orders by the restaurant receiving the order. So I could have, you know, Francesco's pizza receiving the blue one, Luigi's pizza receiving the yellow one, and Mario's pizza receiving the red one. Still, all those are pizza orders, but I store them in different subtopics. Now, if we go back to our three node cluster, what is actually stored in a node is not the entire log. It's only a partition. So this means that if we need to store huge log and we not, don't have enough space on a server to store the uh, entire log, we just need more partition to store it across multiple nodes that have a smaller disk. Just bear with me here, even if here we lose a node, we are not going to lose any information because the same data, the same partition is replicated across the cluster. So now a fundamental question, how do I select a partition? The partition is usually select with the key part of the message. And Kafka by default ensures that messages having the same key will always, la always land to the same partition. Why is this important? Well, because of ordering. Let me show you a little example. I have my producer that produces data to a topic with two partitions. And then I have my consumer. Let's say it's really a simple example. I have only three events, a blue event, number one, a yellow event, number two, and a red event, number three. Now, when producing those events into Kafka, I will have the blue event, first produced to partition zero, the yellow event produced to partition one, and the red event produced to partition zero again. Now, when reading from Kafka, it could happen, it will not always be the case, but it could happen that I will read the events in this sequence, blue one first, red one second, yellow one third. If you check the order of events, it's not correct. So why is this happening? Well, because when we start using partitions, we have to give up on the global ordering. When using partitions, Kafka ensures the correct ordering only per partition. So when we start using partitioning, we have to think about which subset of our entire data set for which of that uh, subset we care about the related ordering. In our pizza example, it makes sense to understand if an order uh, becomes before or after another order for the same shop, but they don't care if an order for Luigi's pizza comes first or after an order for Mario's pizza. Those are more or less unrelated. So I can put those into different partitions. Why partitions are really good? Well, because they allow us also to scale out. If you think about a topic, it's a log. So you have one unique process writing one event after the other. And pretty much the throughput you could think that is defined by that thread writing events. Now with partitions, we have multiple threads writing events. So we could potentially increase a lot the throughput and we can have much many producers writing data into the topic. At the same time, we want to possibly have many consumers re reading data from the topic. Still, we want to read all the data from the topic but we don't want to read the same message twice. In the pizza example, we don't want to make the same pizza twice if we are the pizzeria. So how Kafka does it 
it basically assigns a non-overlapping subset of the partitions to the consumer. If this terminology is not really simple, let me show you in the example. In this case, I have a topic with three partitions and I have two consumers. By default, Kafka will, for example, assign the blue uh, partition to consumer one and the yellow and red partition to consumer two, ensuring that all the messages are being read, but none of the message is read twice. Now, let me show you the partitions in action. And let's go back to my lovely um, Jupyter Notebooks. I will create another partition producer. Uh, it's the same stuff as before. In this case, what I will do differently, I will create a new topic with two partitions because by default, I believe we create topics with only one partition. So let me create the topic with two partitions. And now, before sending the data, let me create a couple of consumers. Consumer one and consumer two at the bottom. So the, the, um, the code for consumer one and consumer two is the same. They are attaching to the topic and Kafka should be able to send one message to one partition and one message to the second partition. So one consumer should be able to read one message and the other consumer should be able to read the second message. Why is that? Well, because you know I'm sending two orders, two pizza orders with a slightly different key. So since I'm using different keys, uh, Kafka will hash the key. And since the keys are different, should use two different partitions to store the events. So let me try it. As expected, I have the two consumer, each one of them reading one single message. The top consumer is reading from partition zero offset zero. So the first message of partition zero, the order from Frank ordering a pizza margarita. The bottom one is reading from partition one offset zero, first message of partition one, the order from Adele ordering a pizza Y. Now, if I insert some new records reusing the same keys, since what I told you before is that Kafka will ensure that every message having the same key will land in the same partition, I'm expecting that the order from Mark will land in the same partition as the order from Frank because they share ID equal to zero as key, and the same for Jan and Adele. Let's find out if I'm lying or if I'm saying the truth. Well, you know, it's working as expected. Mark is landing in the same partition as Frank and Jan in the same partition as Adela. Everything works as expected. Let's go back to a little bit more slides now. So one of the main difference of Kafka to other messaging system is that once you read the message from Kafka, Kafka doesn't delete it, making it available also for other applications to read it. So we had this case before where we had our topic and we had two consumers. Those consumers, we said that they wanted to read all the, top, all the messages from the Kafka topic, but they didn't want to read the same message twice. We could think about those two consumers being the pizza makers. They want to read all the pizza orders, but they don't want to make the same pizza twice. They are working in concurrency. Still, the pizza orders are in Kafka. So we could, for example, have the billing person willing to be interested to receive a copy of all the orders at his own pace in order to do the bills. How we can do that with Kafka? Well, there is a nice concept of consumer groups. We just have to define the two pizza makers being part of the same consumer group. And then we will define the new billing person as part of a new consumer group. And Kafka will understand that the six, this new consumer, is a completely independent application and will start submitting a copy of the same message, uh, the same messages also to this application and will keep the offset of the two application different. I will not demonstrate you this, but uh, in the notebooks, you will find the code in order to do all of it. I want to move to the last part of my talk, which is, as of now, we basically write our code in Python to push the data into Kafka and to pull the data from Kafka. 
In reality, we will adopt Kafka in a lot of places where we will have our data already elsewhere. And we will want to take the data from, for example, from a database into Kafka. Or we'll want to take, the, to take the data in Kafka and push it to a database. And we don't want to write all these connectors by hand. Likely, with Kafka comes also Kafka Connect, which is a pre-built framework that allow us to just say, I want to take the data from this Postgres database or this Cassandra or Google PubSub. And Kafka Connect will take the data from there in the streaming mode, push it to a Kafka topic. At the same time, if we have the data in a Kafka topic, we can reuse Kafka Connect and push the data into Elasticsearch, into Postgres, into Amazon S3 for long-term storage. Kafka Connect allow us to evolve existing application. So if you had your application that was talking with a database, you may not want to change that design because it's still working, but you can adopt Kafka Connect and with change data capture, you can move all the changes in streaming mode to Kafka. Kafka Connect allow also to distribute events. So if you have your application right into Kafka in this case, you can take a a copy of the data in a topic and submit it to a database. Submit to BigQuery because your analytics team is using that. Submit it to Amazon S3 for long-term storage. And now I want to briefly show you the Kafka Connect demo. Let's move again to the uh, notebooks. Oops, there we are. And now let me close a little bit of this. There we are. Um, okay, so I'm creating another producer here. In this case, I, I need to pass not only the order of the pizza, but also the structure of the order in order to be able to decode it and to push it to a relational database. I will take the data from a topic and push it to Postgres. So now let me show you that I'm not lying. Let me recall what the Postgres name was called, PGPI Con Japan Day. Uh, so let me connect. PG icon Japan day. Okay, so this is, let me just copy this and go back here. There we are. So there are no tables as of now in my database. Let me show you that I can, oops, I can create a table with Kafka Connect. So all I need to do is to, first of all, create a topic and submit three rows, ordering Mar Frank ordering pizza margarita, Dan pizza with fries, and Jan pizza with mushrooms. Okay, I created that. Now with Kafka Connect, all I need to know is where to find the data. So in a topic called Francesco Pizza Schema and where to send the data to JDBC Postgres, the Postgres database that I told you before. Let me copy this configuration file. Let me quickly show you that we can create a Kafka Connect connector. Again, this is a managed connector by Ivan. And we can sync the data by JDBC sync into Kafka. So let me edit the config file and let me apply. Let me create the connector. The connector is running. Should we check if we have data in Postgres? Oh, we have a nice Francesco pizza schema table. Let's search. Well, we have exactly the same three rows that we had in the Kafka topic. Now let's go back to our producer and produce one more row, uh, order for Giuseppe ordering a pizza Y. If we click quickly go back to the Postgres database, we have also the last row for Giuseppe pizza Y. So you know what Kafka connected in this case, it automatically created the table in Postgres, started populating the table in Postgres, and now every time it receives a new order, it shows the table in Postgres. Pretty cool, isn't it? You just had to write a configuration file. Now, since we are running out of time, I want to close with a couple of slides, with one slide. And it's all the resources that I want to share with you. First of all, my Twitter handle, 
If you have a lot of questions in the future, come back to me on Twitter. Second, if you want to play with the same notebooks that I was showing you now, they are open source and there is the link. Third one, if you want to play with Kafka and you don't have a streaming data source, and that's pretty complex to find a streaming data source, I create a fake Python streaming data source that produces pizza orders, metrics, um, stocks, and also real stocks information. Last bit, if you want to try Kafka, but you don't have Kafka, well, setting up manually could be quite complex. If you want to have a managed service that you can play with, or that could be your production system in the future, check out Ivan.io because we offer that as a managed service and we offer also $300 and a month of free trial that you can use in order to explore all our services. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and you took something out of it. I will be with you for all the questions that you might have. Thank you very much from Francesco. Time is up. We will have to end here. Thank you for the, um, thank you uh, very much for your talk. And everybody please give a big round of applause to the speaker on Discord. Thank you very much. See you on Discord. If you have any questions and would like to talk to the speaker directly, please go to our chat channel in the ask the speaker session on this code. The track is PyCon JP, the track five. And um, at the last, thank you again for the talk. Uh, you thank could you. Dis uh, connect the session and uh, head over to ask the speaker session on this code. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.